So the idea of this is yes, that Billy. we've got... Why? Why are why we, we here? here? Why, why are we, we, why here, we got why here? Why are we here? Why are we here? This is the first, the inauguration of the Delphi Magdor series of podcasts. And we thought, who better to have than you with Cameron and talk about old friends? And we'd like to try and fill 20 minutes. 20 minutes? Are you going to get an hour and a half? At least. <laughs> you're you're going to get a lot of, you're gonna get a lot conversation of out of this. You're going to get a lot of chat. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to the first ever episode of the Delphi Macintosh Theatre's podcast series. It's a behind-the-scenes look at what's going on in our theatres. I'm Billy Differ, but who better to introduce this and inaugurate the international theatre producer and owner of eight DMT theatres, Sir Cameron Macintosh, along with old friends, see what I did there, Broadway babies and legends, Bernadette Peters and Leah Salonga who are starring in Stephen Sondheim's Old Friends, currently playing at the Gilgood Theatre only until the 6th of January. I'll come to you first, Cameron. Why Old Friends and why now? Well, look, why Old Friends was that our joint old friend, Stephen Sondheim, sadly left the planet on Thanksgiving Day two years ago. Having planted the seed for this show, it was one of the last things that during COVID, when we were both locked away in the country, as Steve said to me, wow, theatres will never open. I said, well, what are we going to do? He said, well, why don't we do another show? We haven't done a review for a long time. And he said, let's start to do it again. And so he started doing his lists. I started doing my lists. Uh, and then before we knew it, COVID was over and we were all trying to get our shows up. And shortly after that, Steve sadly died. And that Christmas, which is just over two years ago, uh, you know, I sat down with all the notes and uh, I went, OK. And I took it from everything that he and I had done on the various shows that we'd done. And I put together the list of songs and how I felt it would come together. And, and by and large, the, the basic structures remained ever since. And then, of course, the first thing I did was, though, because I knew I wanted to put on a a gala to celebrate his life. Um, I, I rang my handful of close friends and Bernadette, one of the first calls I made, um, and Michael Ball. Um, at that point, Leah was... I changed my schedule. She changed her <laughs> schedule so I could be there. and came over. And it was literally, it started off with a handful of people that I knew very, very well to see if, A, they would do it, when if they could come in that date in May. And it miraculously came very quickly together. Matthew Bourne, you know, is a very old friend of mine. I've done both his ballets and he's done my musicals. So uh, he was naturally the person I wanted to uh, to work with. And uh, Maria Friedman came and helped us early on. Um, and Julie McKenzie, of course, he'd not been on the stage for 25 years at that point, um, who is a very old friend and, and part and parcel of all the shows I've done with Steve. She came on board as a performer. We persuaded her to sing again. Everyone adored her. Oh she my was, gosh. God, she was incredible. She was incredible. She was extraordinary. Just um, divine. And and just in terms of that was the gala, but now we're running old friends the show. For real. For real. <laughs> it, this extraordinarily hard to conceive is your bro it's not your Broadway debut, it's your West End debut. Why did it take so long? You know, Cameron never asked me. See Cameron? Uh, he you missed know, the He does now. come up with the odd fib. I <laughs> asked I asked you to come and do putting it together. Oh, yes, I know. But you Tanigu did. couldn't come. Well, I couldn't come. I, That's I was true. actually I had asked her a few he times. He did. He asked me about ten years ago to come here and do it. But there was a time in my life where I just couldn't And and Leah, in terms of you you've obviously done the West End. You right. famously did Miss Saigon, right. which was a, a, you know, an extraordinary thing. Um, not but, a bad way to debut. Yeah, well, that was your debut, not a bad way right? To debut. The Saigon, yeah. yeah. And, and you've done uh, Broadway, you did uh, Fontaine, but you were in the anniversary performance, I think, as Fontaine at the Albert I Hall? I did both. The 10th anniversary, I did Eponine. That was at the Royal Albert Hall. The one at the O2, which is the 25th, I sang Fontaine. So I have done both of the dead girls on Broadway. The young one and the older The old one. Older. older. I mean, she's older. not that much older. You played the English girl on Broadway in oh, Song and Dance. I did. 
Sullivan Den uh, with a Cockney the, accent. Yes, mm-hmm. and then you Absolutely. reprised that magnificently at Hey Mr. Producer yep. here when you did the concert. Uh, well, yeah, I didn't say did. I didn't no, say no, that. She didn't. No, but Cameron brought me here to I see how it, I see darling, how I, I, I grab her back anytime. Whenever there's a freebie, I said, "Come here, darling." Royal Festival Hall. He yes. presented me at yes. Royal Festival, uh, no, and that's that was where the first I, concert. That's where I did the English girl. You did. I can't, yeah, yeah, you did do it. I'm there. sorry. Yeah. Yeah. And then yeah. he Mr. Because I wasn't he Mr. Producer. Yeah, so I remember seeing say, yeah. the yes. English yes. girl. So as we haven't worked together since then, that's the point that the three of you are now. Again, it's, it's just that so we're actually the three of us are together doing, doing, doing this since, since, since that night. Okay, Mr. Producer, yeah, this was, what, 27 or so years ago. Yes, it I'm is. afraid so. But just obviously, people are interested to know in terms of your enjoyment of London versus New York. What have you embraced? Have you become very English or? Are you resisting that and being an American and saying no? no God, I no! I lo- I've always loved London. I've always enjoyed it. What I admire so much in the English people, in the English actors, is that they live like an hour away or an hour more away, and they're they never, you know, they're here at a you know, our ten o'clock call. If you have, we did West End Wolf, they were had to come early. I mean, and you never hear, oh, darling, I live too far away. I can't come. No, in New York, you go, you'd hear. Oh, I live in Westchester. I can't make it into that. Here it's like, yes, there's rain and snow. Well, there's no snow here, but rain. And they just take the trains, which go on strike all the time. So they have to adjust and take a bus. But they still get here. But they still get here. And I just love them for that and their talent. But that grit, that who they are, that core is amazing. But talking of the core, so she was the core for me to get the show up there and get everyone around and of course i knew immediately on having seen it that the show was special there was something about the way the material all came together as it was originally with side by side it was a show created out of love for a particular reason a love of steve and mine was a love and a celebration of steve so both shows have the same genesis but i i could see it was going to be a different kind of show and of course we put everybody that we could get into it for the galas and then I said to Bernadette, look, I'd really love to do this. And she said, no, I'd love to do this. And perhaps this can be the, the chance for her to come to London. And um, so I I knew, obviously, with side by side in my head, the clue was two fabulous leading ladies that took and brought and were the, and were the, the mothers of an extraordinary group of all stars. It needed to. The material is all star. And it requires all stars to do it. So I'm in I'm in America chatting to Seth, who worked on the show with me. I'm going, now. I just got to work out who I'm going to bring. And I suddenly thought, I haven't worked with Leia for ages. I wonder if she'd like to come to London. <laughs> uh, and she came to my office in New York. And I told and I, she hadn't it seen it. It was a she full hadn't on seen it. presentation. It was. I gave you on, on my phone. On wow, a laptop. A full on, on camera. On Seth's it was laptop. laptop. And it was, do you know what was so interesting? As I point, you know, because you show someone the odd number that they would like me to sing. And then I was showing just a few of the segments, like Sunday. An hour's worth, by the way. It was an hour's worth. <laughs> but it was Sunday. It was Sunday. In, it was Sunday in the park. And she just looked at us and I said, You need to be in that. And she just looked at me and she said, Of course. You can only do these scenes if you have real actors doing them. It won't, they won't come alive. Everybody has to be an everything. And I went, by George, she's got it. She's always been a smart girl. <laughs> Clever girl. Clever girl. Clever girl. <laughs> but, it, but, but there is absolutely no way to describe the audience reaction. Do, do you feel that on the stage? Yeah, yeah. yeah like it's, it's palpable. Do you feel it, Leah? Yeah. Absolutely. At the end, you know, each audience has their own personality. Some are raucous and some are quiet. But at the end, they all jump up and they're crying. And all different kinds of people just going to, and and coming back because they want that experience again. They want... Well, I, I'm, this is not to blow smoke. No, she blows the trumpet. You blow the trumpet, I blow the smoke. Um, this is someone that went last night. What can I say? We laughed, we cried. It felt like we were at the most wonderful one-night tribute to Sondheim. It's extraordinary that the this electric atmosphere of a special gala event 
is clearly delivered on a daily basis. Being alive, there are no words to capture the wonderfulness and the emotional impact. I think I really could experience this every day for a long time. And that's not unusual. So have, you, have they booked for tonight? They're booked no. again. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that is very wonderful to, you know, to, for you to be part of. Wonderful. And yeah. also you realise that this composer wrote, Cameron chose what the, what the song should be, but the breadth and depth of what Steve wrote, what could write and did write, and when he was funny and he was de- deep and he was witty and he was satirical but but he wrote about the human condition and I think everyone in the audience is relating to that and also the uplifting part of it. That's the bit that surprised me I have to say that there was that as you say uplifting inner feeling with with, with the production and everyone involved you, you get this sense of it being something bigger than everyone I think yeah. all of us realise that how, yeah. how special this this production is that we all get to think about something important, something real. And I think also, you know, the truth is there's some wonderful writers that have written for the musical theatre, but there is no other great writer than I can think in the world has ever written the range that you just said. Yes, yeah, the range. Of this. And they're all plays. They all stand up in their own right. So, you know, we don't need to explain what they are. You know, they... they it sort of Steve takes us all the way through the, the entire evening and it all sort of interweaves in it. And this material will never date. It, this, this piece can be done by talented people for as long as people will sing songs from the theatre uh, and it will go forever. And I think we're all aware that there's never been a show like this. There'll never be another show like this and there'll never be another. And that's because there's never going to be another Steve that has all of that in one extraordinary mind that yeah not that long ago i think it was last week we had just for fun a run of the show where the folks who were covering would go on for the parts they were covering so i went on for the trumpet i went on for you could drive a person crazy and i would sit in the audience and i would sit in the stalls and watch everybody else and the thing that was really striking was how personal the material felt to every person that was covering and how it felt like a, a wholly different experience. It's like, what, what show am I watching? And you know that it's old friends, but a song that say Bernadette sings every night in the hands of another actor takes on a whole different character. And I'm like, oh my God, what a gift it is to see this person singing this because the information is different and where it's coming from is different and you sit there thinking and the oh song time lyrics allow that yeah. to be part of their exactly characterization. And so you know another human being inhabiting a song that is inhabited by someone else normally eight times a week the trajectory becomes different and it becomes such an interesting exercise well, well i have to say that some somebody said to me they thought i was going a bit loopy when and they because they, they heard so they'd been to see the, uh, the, uh, a rehearsal and said, um, who, who's that playing uh, in Mrs. Lovett? I said, it's... <laughs> that happens a lot. Does that seems, happen a lot? I wonder. It seems to happen a lot. But sophisticated people I know who know Leia in her own right, I just do not know. It's, and it's what, that's what I love about the show. It's so full of surprises of people doing my things own they never would have thought My own voice teacher had to ask me to my face. No. My, my, own, voice. my own voice teacher, Mary Hammond, she she came backstage for drinks on a Saturday night when she saw the show. She's like, so who's playing Love It? I'm like, Mary. <laughs> <laughs> that was, you mean in this show or do you mean in some other production? It's like, no, here, who, who was playing? The, that was the, me. <laughs> it was me. And the other, the other aspect that I think takes people by surprise is the comic act. And to pick up on what you were saying earlier about it's not just... Um, singers doing a concert version. This is act proper yeah, acting, and, it's th- and proper you musical. see that. And but but the the, the f- there's the the you know when you do Little Red Riding Hood, that oh. scene <laughs> is just that first one is entirely entirely yours. But Bernadette, she <laughs> rang me. She said, "I'd like to I'd like to do this song. I know things now as an older person from how I it was done originally in the show." And I said, I said, that sounds fun. And then she rang me up a few days later saying, 
I better get this, see if this works, she said. And she took it on tour. I did. She was doing a concert so she tour and tried it. it out. Because I said it kind of off the cuff. Well, little bit writing, I've always thought that'd be fun. You said, oh, that sounds like a great idea. And then I went, oh, my God, I'm a grown woman singing this. So in the Me Too movement, I'm going, what am I? And I had to figure out. And so I actually did it in my concert. Of right. <laughs> and, um, and it worked, you know, so I figured out I could, I could do that. Oh, well, for and no, now I no keep doubt. fooling around with it, making it more and more fun. So, yeah. and in terms of the, the the orchestra being on stage, is that is that a benefit to you? Because uh, you both do concerts, it's easier to mic. It's it's definitely much less of a challenge with the orchestra on stage in the open, and you know, there's I don't think that there's a whole lot that needs to be done as far as because when they're in the pit, you have to think about how to amplify everything. They become like another character in the show. Oh, like yeah. Have- the show would work if they were in the pit because you've got to remind people that this is not a, a, a through written musical. Right, right, it, right. It, it morphs in and out of suddenly creating a show, a dramatic show, but you know, it is a concert in style up to a, a highly theatricalized. It and if you you can't do that without having them up there. And I I just think it's it's so wonderful and it's also fantastic to see and hear musicianship of that quality. Yeah. Oh my. And in I this call Alfonso a secret weapon. He's not a secret weapon, but to me, it's like my secret. I love him, Alfonso. And also the arrangements with Stephen Metcalf having been involved yes. in. He did well. I mean, you know, he's pulled them because he's a great scholar from all the original. A lot of it's a lot of it is Jonathan Tunick, who is probably the 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 orchestrator who has the most worked with Steve. But he has changed. He's he's created his own world while being truthful to the original, but at the same time creating a tapestry that this all sounds like it's all orchestrated by one person. Absolutely. And Bill Braun, who he also worked a lot with, did some of that for the Hamster to producer. In fact. Broadway Baby and Being Alive uh, and several of the other songs in it were specially orchestrated for Hey Mr. Producer by Bill. Uh, and, you know, they were they are simply wonderful. And Metcalf did the whole thing for the gala. Uh, but what I'm saying is all of those songs have been used. And, and in fact, even in putting it together when we first did it, Jonathan had rearranged many of the other things from his other shows for the atmosphere of putting it together. And in fact, there's lots of things we've drawn from that, which have now turned into what we're doing, you see. And so the whole thing has has woven out of our our life experience over the last 45 years with Steve. And the company itself, I mean, working with you, I hear, because I sometimes uh, fortunate to be able to pop into the theatre, and you just hear camaraderie that you don't always witness, if I could be sensitive enough to... I like how everyone... sensitive you are being. <laughs> I'd be a little more blunt. Okay, so it's not always this good. No, it's, what... it's not. I think it was and Bonnie said, she said, my God, this is the best job ever. Who said this? Bonnie Langford. Oh, yeah. Oh, she's... I heard Janie the other said, she said, I know it's going to finish, but I want to stay here forever. So she said... <laughs> yeah. It does make a difference. When the relationships backstage and behind the scenes are great. And then you have actors that have had those experiences and and now they're here with us and and they they don't have issues anymore. They've they're all they've gone through all that stuff and, and they appreciate this they we all know how special this is. But I do think leading a company it can be i I was about I can say that. Yes. Is these two are very special. And though they knew each other, they have become old friends through this. New friends who've become old friends. Right. And the thing is, all the other ladies and and indeed gentlemen who have who are in this sort of, of, of the the middle range of this show, they've all been leading ladies and um the great and ladies and gentlemen in shows. Yeah. That's where the camaraderie has come. The, the the respect for each other on stage and the realization. That in our long careers, this hardly ever happens. You know, when I did Hey, Mr. Producer, I was in a dressing room with Judy Dench and Julie Andrews and Melissa Martin and Julia McKenzie and Elaine Page and Maria. <laughs> yes. And, and, I, and I went, these people are, we're all sharing the dressing room together. These people are so wonderful. And then 
I'm in for the gala. There I am again with Judy Dench and, <laughs> and Batula Clark and Amelda Staunton, who was out there being a cheerleader and coming back and saying, oh, yes, that's great what you're wearing. Wear that. And said, no, that's great. And then, and, you know, and, and again, Julia McCann. And I'm going, I just love these great English women that are theater actors. And I heard that it's it's a uh, community. Yeah. And that also made me want to come back. And that's right. the experience that we're having. Yeah. Well, that's really nice to hear. Being supported like that. And you also brought over the the uh, Broadway Barks. You brought that to... Called West End Wolves. West End Wolves. Cameron and Broadway Barks, to be clear, West End Wolves. Wolves. That's right. And it was a great success. And Cameron helped us. And, and Leia was there. And and uh, wasn't it great? It helps. Yeah, it was good. <laughs> It was a great whisk. Every, every, every woofer in town was pulled out. <laughs> it was great. And a lot of the animals that were shown in that audience have gotten adopted. Many. Have they? Yeah, about really? 11 so far. Yeah. Oh, my God. Huge St. Bernard's that were, I, how old? Six months old. How will, How big will she get? She'll be double the size. I've never. It's probably going to be the size of that sofa. A bear. I mean, and they both. <laughs> now they sent us pictures of them laying on their sofas in the people's homes and and uh, so this was sort of like a first. First, they didn't really understand what we would, the rescues go, what do you mean bring dogs to you? I went, yeah, in the St. You know, Paul's church, the actor's church. And they thought about it, and first we couldn't get anybody. And then they started slowly. We got, we got eight wonderful shelters that came, and it was great. And they said, this is great. We want to do it every year, so I'm coming back. You are coming back, absolutely. For wolves. That would be wolf. I'm wolfing next year, <laughs> September. <laughs> oh, so it's a great thing. And I'm so I'm so happy that we were able to do that. Oh, yeah. No, that, yeah. As a contribution, you know, to, to the, as you see, the community, that is wonderful yes. to, yeah. to have, have, have been yeah, part of, for beautiful sure. Beautiful creatures that just, you know, they needed to. They needed to be seen. Well, what can I say? Yeah. Now I've got a question which I like to ask all of you individually. Okay. And no, don't look so worried, Leah. I always look so worried. What does live theatre mean to you? Oh, great! Am I starting this? What does live theatre mean? Um. Well, it, it means story. Wrong. It means storytelling. It means community. It means being in a room with other people and just sharing what you know about life, oftentimes through the words of someone else who can write better than you and just being a vessel or a conduit for their words and then putting your own life in combination with that and then sharing it with a room full of other people. Um, wonderful, yeah. wonderful. Bernadette, what does live theater mean to you? Well, an example is what happens every night. First of all, it only happens that night, that performance and that audience and you on stage and we're all in this space together and it's only for us that night because it's going to be different the next night. But when you get the right combination of people and songs and uh, what you want to say, it can be this experience that the audience is having, which is they go through this journey and they're uplifted at the end. And that's what makes it worth it for me. That's what makes it worth it. For Absolutely. Me. Yeah. Cameron, what does live theatre mean to you? Well, there's three parts to it. The most wonderful thing for me, been lucky enough to do it a few times, is to find something that I want to work on with the authors. And then I work on, like in confession with the authors, not the directors, not the choreographers, not the workshops, but just with them until I get it to the best I can out of it. Then you hand it over to a wonderfully talented team with directors, choreographers, and then we find actors who bring that to life. So there's the moment where your baby has to be handed over to be brought up. And then you have the most wonderful group of people bring their art to the rehearsal room. But you don't know what it's going to be like until you get it in front of an audience. And that is when, even if a show... If, it, if it's quite right, it works. But when you have something that is really special and you might change it later, as I've done many times um, with both Les Mis and with, with Miss Saigon over the years, it still was always right and you just 
have a great chance to polish your art. But the third thing for me, and it's something that I clocked when I on my 16th birthday when I was taken to see the last night of My Fair Lady um, in London. And I remember that they were about two years in, and I remember going, it's good, but it's not quite like Rex and Julie. And on the last night, apart from the Doolittle, it was very nice. It wasn't, it was a f fabulous evening, but not the most fabulous show. And I remember precociously at the age of 16 going, if I become a producer like I want to be, I'll never let that happen with my own shows. And for me, the thing I'm most proud of around the world is that my shows are as good, if not better, 40 years old as when they first opened. And that's what I've helped reinvent the theatre because I always wanted, once I got these shows up, for them to be living organisms. Yes. That ev just as you're talking about what yeah. what was happening, watching the run through there, it's another, it's a, it's a, it's a, to get a whole new group of actors, it's a different way of bringing the show up. What's the way again. you cast it, too, and the way you personally, cast it. that and new you, camera. And you, and you cast it, but it's just not, not just me, it's my team. But a, able to do that so that you can go there and people can see these great shows of which there has never that been that many of them performed as wonderfully as they are by all the great casts in the West End. And and to just to pick up what you said about the other day doing the run through layer with different people, that's a version of what you're saying here. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And yeah. th that, you know, even though the run is, there's not that much longer in the run, the, the fact that people want to do that, to look at that, to explore that, to be part of, I think is amazing. These great actors, like we should mention all the Denny D and Bonnie Langford, Claire Burt, Gavin, Cook, absolutely, and all the younger ones, Damon Bradley Hungry, Jayden, yeah. Yeah. Bradley, Bradley Jaden, Marley uh, Fenton, and Jack Yarrow. God. They're all they're the stars of tomorrow. Jeremy and Seacombe. I should mention Jeremy, Jeremy Seacombe, Seacombe because I have to do absolutely. Sweeney with him every night. My God, <laughs> Bella B. And um, yeah. yeah, Bella Brown, uh, B. Penny Tway, yeah. Harry so Ash, you know, Marley if this Fenton, show yeah. if gets to New, New York or America, I wish I could take every one of them with me because it's gonna, it is the most time. Well, <laughs> I'm the, planting the, the, seeds. There are dreams Why? in there are no, dreams what? in show business, but um, <laughs> no. well, it's nice uh, to dream, even yes. to hear you dreaming. Yeah. Yeah, dream but all is I'm free. saying is, I can't it imagine a, most to one, dream. A, a more wonderful group of people and. Uh, we've been thrillingly lucky to have such great talent. Thrillingly lucky. Like, who who can do the boy from dot, 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 the way J.E.D. does it every night? It's hilarious. It's absolutely hilarious. Well, I, it's leaves me just to say thank you to the three of you. I found this an absolute pleasure and privilege to be here sitting with Sir Cameron McIntosh. Leah Salonga and Bernadette Peters in such a beautiful, beautiful sweater. Oh, here it's <laughs> only it was going so well. In Scarparelli pink. <laughs> oh, thank you so much. For people that can, well, <laughs> and I, yeah. Well, with, well it's a glorious shade of, yeah. <laughs> it's the it's same. The You're the same face. shade as your face yes, now. You thank you. <laughs> Don't forget, Old Friends is only playing at the Gilgood Theatre until the sixth of January. So go to delphonmackintosh.co.uk to get your tickets. Listen out for our next podcast with the winners of I Have a Dream, who are taking over the roles of Sophie and Skye in Mamma Mia. Mm -hmm.